It was three years after Elizabeth Eckford and the Little Rock Nine were admitted to Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, that Ruby Bridges, a little first grade African-American girl, took her first steps into public school. She was the first. She was, for the first year, the only African-American child in the New, or New Orleans public schools. I've read some stories and extended uh, reports about this. When she was taken to school that day, she was accompanied, obviously, as the picture shows, by Norman Rockwell with federal marshals. And so it continued all year. She went into the schoolroom facing the same kind of crowds that Elizabeth Eckford did in Little Rock. Hostile white crowds screaming at her. And she walked with great composure, this tiny little girl, into the school and into her classroom. As it turned out, the public school administrators there in New Orleans knew that they were required by federal law to allow Ruby to attend their school. It's just that they weren't going to allow her to mix with any other children. They put her in one classroom. She was alone with a young white teacher who was a first year teacher. And she spent all day with that teacher in that classroom, including the lunch hours. And then at the end of the day, the marshals would escort her out the building and she would go home. This fabulous oil painting by Norman Rockwell is now in the National Portrait Gallery. Uh, President Obama had it taken from the gallery, brought into the ante room just outside the Oval Office, where it hung, and every day the visitors to the Oval Office could see this famous problem we all live with by Norman Rockwell as they came into the President's office. And there's a great picture that was taken by Pete Souza, uh, the official White House photographer at the time, of Ruby Bridges, now an adult in her 60s, with the, pre with the President. A dream they both never imagined would ever come true. This stamp commemorates the desegregation of public schools. Again, it was May 17, 1954. Uh, the decision came out of the Supreme Court. It was a unanimous decision by the court, nine to nothing, and Chief Justice Warren was very careful in expecting and setting the discussion so that it would not be a split decision, seven, two, eight, one. It had to be nine to nothing, and it was. The Monroe School, where Linda Brown and the other black children went to school down in Topeka is now a National Historic Site. I encourage you to go visit the school. As I note here, the work is not yet done. Linda Brown died about two years ago. Her sister, uh, Cheryl Brown Henderson, who's an attorney in Topeka, is still very active in the foundation they have for this purpose. Now, on to a little lighter news. Thanks, Clarence. Clarence Birdseye was a guy who went fishing up in the Northwest with uh, some Native Americans or Alaskan Natives and discovered how they used a flash freezing process to keep their fish frozen. Because if you freeze them slowly and you defrost them slowly, then the tissue of the fish all breaks down. So he adapted this to packaged foods. And it's because of Clarence Birdseye that you have anything to eat in the dining hall because most of the food that arrives there is frozen. He invented the process, a $7 investment, sold the patent for $22 million, and gave us this great slogan, Better Buy Birdseye. Malcolm McLean is somebody that you probably have never thought about before. He was a fellow who discovered while America was going to war, what they would do is they would take all the tanks and jeeps and they put them in packing crates. And the packing crates would go well on the ships. They could drop them in the holds of the ship and they'd pack one box on top of another on top of another. And so what he did after the war is he developed these standardized shipping containers. And in 1956, before these containers were online, if you had a shipment, it would come on a pallet 
it would come in boxes. The longshoreman would have to unload every box, unload every pallet, and it cost $6 a ton in 1956 to unload freight, which obviously went right to the cost of every good that people bought. After we used containerized freight, it went down to 16 cents per ton. Malcolm McLean, he is the reason that foreign trade has become affordable and that manufacturing shift, shifted offshore from America to the Far East and to all over the world because now you can get these material, these packaged goods, direct from the factory right to the retailer, all in the same package. Thank you, Malcolm McLean, for our cheap products that are plentiful for us in America. Now, prohibition was one of those things that came and went. I talked about images and trends that came and went. This was a crusade that was taken by the Women's Christian Temperance Union in the 19th century, carried over into the 20th century. They finally got the, the 18th Amendment adopted, prohibiting alcohol everywhere in America. And of course, what it did is it turned alcohol production into an illegal activity that still a lot of nice people, as well as criminals, people took advantage of. Eventually, some years later, in 1933, the 21st Amendment to the Constitution was adopted. This was uh, also known as the Great Experiment. Um, America has gotten past this, if you will. The Great Migration. I have a whole lesson that I'll do on the Great Migration, but I just want to introduce you to the idea that during Reconstruction in the 19th century, African Americans were freed, but they didn't have much ability to move from place to place. Eventually, they got some jobs, and then after their uh, quest, the industrialization really was going on in the North, and so agents would come down to the South looking for plentiful labor and would sell these people on the idea, moving Chicago, Pittsburgh, all these great centers, and get jobs. Between 1910 and 1930, about a million and a half moved. Between 1940 and 1970, another five million came. By 1970, all these African Americans who had just 50 years earlier all lived in the South and in rural circumstances, all lived in cities. You'll see that when we cover the Great Migration. This is one of the great displacements of people and families, and it has changed America in so many ways. Now, speaking of change in America, de jure and de facto segregation. When Rosa Parks sat down on that Montgomery, Alabama bus, she actually violated a law. It was a Montgomery ordinance that said the private bus companies, and they were all private at the time, could require African Americans to sit in certain sections and could drive them out of the whites only section. Well, she was not about to be moved on that day in 1955. That was segregation de jure by the law. De facto segregation means segregation by custom. Uh, this theater, the Gem Theater, movies, hotels, restaurants, were segregated by custom. Everybody knew that African Americans were not welcome there. They could not sit in the lunch counters. They could not trade there. They could not uh, roller skate in those places. That was de facto segregation by custom. Claire McArdle, I had a student the first semester I taught this, uh, Rachel Francis, who went out and she was looking for a chance to sort of sump the professor. And she came up with a topic I'd never heard about, and it was Claire McArdle, a fashion designer. Claire McArdle was active in the 19, up to 1958 when she died. And her tremendous gift was, remember, women in the 20th century, up until about 1950s, made their own clothes because they couldn't afford store-bought clothes. Store-bought clothes were just for the wealthy. I'll show you that in a later lesson. Claire McArdle design, created simple designs, stylish designs. Remember, American women 
who were making their own clothes faced the Depression starting in 1929 and all through the 30s. They faced the war years and they didn't have much of a chance for any expression of femininity and style if you were working class. If you were high class, uh, upper class, it was not a problem. So she designed using ordinary fabrics, cottons and wools that would be available to women. These are classic styles that the young ladies in the class probably recognize. Thank you, Claire McArdle, for an image, for a trend, for an American mass culture that came and stayed. The same thing was true for men. Men had this look represented by Gregory Peck from a film, The Gray, Man in the Gray Flannel Suit. Up until the time that I was working in Chicago in the 1980s, this is the way we dressed. We dressed with white shirts, we dressed with suits, or occasionally sport coats, and everybody you saw on the train, the men who were going downtown, were dressed like this. The same way these men in the slide are shown at a luncheon uh, counter, uh, luncheon table. This look of formality died late in the 20th century. Even people who go to funerals, even people who are laid out in their caskets do not appear in suit and tie. This is the story of the beginnings of mass American culture in the 20th century. These are images and trends that came and went.